Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 14th of April and quite a few updates this week. As always, I have the chapters so you can jump to a particular update you care about the most. New videos this week, I created and went down a rabbit hole all about containers. So I created this video about what are containers, but it's more about how do they work? What are some of the primitives in Linux that power containers? How is it actually enabled to have this isolation and control? And it's about an hour 40, so we're going into a huge amount of detail, way more than you probably ever want to know about. But it was a huge amount of fun for me to go and dig into that and then try and share that information if you were interested. On to what's new. So on the compute side, a number of the Azure Kubernetes service updates. So firstly, if we're using the managed Prometheus service in Azure, obviously Prometheus is fantastic for the gathering of data from Kubernetes. The managed Prometheus offering, hey, just makes that native to Azure and saves me having to go and do those deployments and worry about the components. Well, it can also now collect metrics from Windows node pools. So it worked before with the Linux node pools and that works with Windows as well. So it's just gonna go and add a Windows daemon set on the node pools to enable that collection. That is for Windows Server 2019 and Windows Server 2022. Also for Azure Kubernetes Service, there's this new node resource group lockdown in preview. And the other one was preview as well. So if I think about normally with Azure Kubernetes Service, the virtual machine scale sets that power the node pools are deployed to a resource group and I can see them. I can actually potentially interact with them and cause damage. So what this feature will do, it will add a deny assignment to that resource group that contains the node pool to basically stop you messing with it. It will help protect you from yourself and it will force you to make any changes through what is the correct mechanism, which is the AKS control plane. So this, once it hits GA, would probably be recommended for most environments and it will force that best behavior and avoid a lot of the problems that people bring on themselves. For the Azure Virtual Machines, we have Gen 2. So Gen 2 is UEFI based. It exposes things like the virtual TPM. It has virtualization-based security. And with that virtual TPM and those VBS enhancements, I can have things like secure boot and measured boot, which are utilized by this trusted launch capability in Azure. Now, historically, I have to enable trusted launch at the time of the VM creation. But what this private preview lets you do, so you have to go and sign up for this, is I can take an existing Gen 2 VM that I didn't configure as trusted launch and enable it for trusted launch. I do have to stop and deallocate and then obviously restart the VM to use this, but it's gonna let me then take advantage of all those capabilities, which gives me protection all the way through from the virtual hardware through to the operating system, helping protect me from things like boot kits, et cetera. So that's a, a pretty big deal. And the Azure VMware solution, remember that's where you create your own virtual clusters of VMware-based solutions, is now available in Central Qatar. So that's gonna use the AV36P SKU, which is 36 cores, 768 gigabytes of RAM, and I think 19.2 terabytes of SSD per node. Obviously I have multiple nodes, I combine them together to get my virtual SAN where I actually can use my storage. But I could now leverage that if I want to really just leverage my existing skills, lift and shift my VMware to Azure and not think about maybe more of the Azure primitives, uh, I can do that with the Azure VMware solution. The Azure App Configuration service now has geo-replication in GA. So I use Azure App Configuration to have a store, which is a whole set of key value pairs that I'm using as configuration for my application. So rather than having some app specific configuration, I use uh, the Azure App Configuration service and use that for all my configuration. Well, now it can replicate that store to as many other regions as I want. It is eventual consistency, which means it's not synchronous. It's not even guaranteeing um, read and write in the same order, but eventually it will get there. But this is really useful if I have applications in multiple regions this would enable me, well, for one thing, if I have an app in a certain region, I can point it to the endpoint of the replica in that same region so it reduce any latency. If there were maybe potential um, limits, 
on the number of interactions I could have, like request limits, well now I can distribute them over multiple replicas. And of course it just gives me resiliency and I could add my own failover logic to say, hey, if this endpoint is not available, go to this other endpoint for your configuration. So that's gonna be really useful. Azure Container Apps have got some network changes in preview. And this is all tied to a new type of plan, which I'll talk about in a second. Remember, Azure Container Apps are really useful for my container-based microservices, my container-rised applications. It abstracts away what can be seen as a complicated topic of the Azure Kubernetes service, but it's still there underneath. But it adds things like Keda for the scaling, it adds Dapper to add a lot of capabilities that are useful for my microservices, abstraction of backend storage, um, ways to discover services, huge amounts of things, network additions so I can easily do blue-green deployments and, and changes over. But what these network changes let me now do is a couple of things. Firstly, I can now apply a user-defined route. And why that's really useful is I can now say, hey, the outbound traffic, I wanna send you to a firewall, to a virtual appliance, which I couldn't do before. Also, the minimum subnet size is now a slash 27, which is much smaller than the previous size. Now, to get these network changes, I have to use this new container app dedicated plan option. So there is a new consumption plus dedicated plan. This is a fully managed environment. It supports scale to zero, so I can still only pay for what I want, but optionally I can run a set of customized hardware and maybe it gives me better predictability of cost. I can get dedicated workload profiles. And with that, I can then get these network changes. So these two things uh, are really tied together. And then for Azure Functions, there's a new V4 programming model. And when I'm using Node.js, there's a number of enhancements with this. Previously, there was a very fixed folder structure I had to adhere to for my triggers that goes away. There's new HTTP types like blob and JSON and text. There's better IntelliSense. There's a whole bunch of extra features. And in the description below is a link to an article that goes through those. But it's basically just the next version of the model for how I can interact with Azure Functions and Node.js. And then also there's some improved scaling for Azure Functions. And this is, this is pretty cool. So in the past, we're used to the idea of scaling based on maybe some pretty complicated logic and I could add a worker at a time and I could remove a worker at a time. What this improved scaling does is a target-based scaling. Now it only works with certain types of source. Uh, those types of source are service bus queues and topics, storage queues, event hubs, and Cosmos DB extensions. And what this new scaling lets me do is, well, instead of that incremental scaling, it's just gonna look at, well, what is the event source length? What is the, the length of all the items in that source divided by the number of executions that can be handled per instance, and that will result in the new number of workers I need. And it can scale by four at a time, so it's a much faster set of scaling. So hey, if I had a queue depth of 10,000, and each instance could handle 2,000, well, divide those things, hey, I need five worker instances, and it could maybe jump by four at a time, instead of having to do one at a time and then wait. So it's gonna be a much faster and a much simpler mechanism to actually do my scaling. Um, Azure Static Web Apps now have Python 3.10 support. So if I'm a Python person, that's gonna be super useful. And I've mentioned this before, but virtual machine scale sets now have the application rich health states in GA. So the application health extension helps me with certain management tasks, certain upgrade tasks. And there's two new states. Basically I get initializing and unknown, and this will give me more control over understanding, hey, what is the state of the VM as I start to roll out changes as I make those various updates to my virtual machine scout set. On the networking side, so the Nginx as a service. Remember, Nginx is a very powerful layer seven load balancing solution. It's one of the most used um, virtual appliances running in Azure. And so now this partnership between Microsoft and F5 brings it 
as a very easy to deploy appliance, very easy to configure. I can do all of it through the portal if I wish. I can take my existing configuration, so bring your own configuration and apply it, but it's gonna leverage things like Azure Key Vault for the SSL TLS certificate management. It's gonna hook into Azure Monitor so I can go and see my availability, my usage, my performance. I can have JSON web token authentication. I can have single sign-on. I can have active health checks, but it's all easy to provision and still, I don't have to start from scratch. I can still bring a configuration I want. So there's this whole new capability. It's in the Azure Marketplace. It's gonna be consumption-based billing. So I'll pay for the amount of time um, this thing exists. Uh, I pay for what I use. On the database side, a whole set of PostgreSQL flexible updates. So the Alive metrics are in preview. This is a new database is Alive metric. And exactly as the name suggests, it lets me know if my database is available or not. It's a one minute signal that's gonna update and I can go back 93 days. So I can go and see the availability of my PostgreSQL flexible. There's also this new query performance insight. So this is built on top of the query store but it's gonna let me have insight into the performance of queries executed against the database. So I can identify slow or long running queries and then improve the performance of my application that integrates and utilizes that PostgreSQL. So I could see, for example, what are the weight statistics associated with a certain query? I could see if there's changes in my query performance that may then hint, hey, I need to go and make some changes to indexes, maybe some maintenance is required. Also, talking about performance, there are these performance workbooks. So these help me troubleshoot elements of performance for my PostgreSQL Flexible. So this could be high CPU, high memory, high IOPS, high temporary files usage, how my auto vacuum is performing. So for each type of workload, there's a workbook, and those workbooks have charts and guidelines that help me troubleshoot and view um, the current status. Also, new burstable SKUs have gone GA. Remember, the burstable SKUs are all about, I get a certain amount of provision CPU of the VM SKU, maybe it's 10%. So it's way less than the full CPU, so I pay less money. But if I use less than that provisioned amount, maybe I run at 5%, I start to accrue CPU credit. And then if I get sporadic busy times, I can burst up and use maybe 100% of the CPU. So it's a lot more cost efficient if I do have these more bursty type workloads. So the B4, B8, B12, B16, B20 can all now be utilized with PostgreSQL Flexible. Cosmos DB serverless now can support up to one terabyte of storage. Um, so this is really just about, hey, I only pay the request units for the work I'm actually doing for the database operations and the amount of storage consumed. But now I can get even more storage. And something I did forget to mention actually for Postgres Flexible, um, it's now available in the Australia Central region as well. And then Cosmos DB for Postgres SQL. This was the old hyperscale using the Citus extension so I can shard my data, I can get larger databases, I can get higher performance. Well, you can now stop and start. So what that lets me say is, when I'm stopping and starting, I'm stopping the compute and starting the compute. So I can stop paying for the compute side of the workload. I'd still pay for the provision storage, but imagine a dev test environment, I can greatly reduce my bill by when I'm not using it, stop all of the compute side, and I just pay for that storage. So that is now GA. And then finally, also Cosmos DB for PostgreSQL, RESTful APIs have gone GA. So the whole point here is, hey, the REST endpoint I can use for all of my control plane interactions with my Cosmos DB for PostgreSQL cluster. So if I think about these resource provider interactions, deploy, manage, promote clusters, manage the coordinator, the worker configuration, manage the firewall rules, manage the private endpoints, manage the private link resources, manage roles. All of that I can do through the RESTful endpoint instead of having to which means I can do it programmatically. That, that's really the big deal about this. And then finally, for Azure SQL Database, uh, for transparent data encryption, customer managed key, there are two updates. So firstly, I can now have a different CMK per database. This used to be at the database server level, but now I could have a different key 
for each database belonging to the same database server. So that gives me a better granularity to have different encryption keys for different databases. But also now that encryption key can be in a different Azure AD tenant than that of the database. If I was a, an ISV, maybe I have a SaaS solution and I've got lots of different customers, this would enable the customer to keep the key in their key vault under their subscription in their tenant, but I use it to encrypt the database I'm hosting for them for their data. So that's a pretty big deal uh, with those changes. And then finally, miscellaneous. Um, Chaos Studio, this lets me create my experiments to say, what if this zone failed, this rack fails, this CPU spikes, is now available in Sweden Central. And then Hot Patch for Server Azure Edition with Desktop Experience is in preview. So remember, Hot Patch lets me reduce greatly the number of reboots associated with Patch Tuesday. It actually can patch things in the kernel without having to reboot the operating system. But previously, it only worked for server core. Server core doesn't have a GUI. Now, it works in preview with desktop experience. So desktop experience adds that graphical user interface to Windows Server. We typically use that for things like remote desktop services where I actually need a full GUI. Most of the time, we'd rather have server core. I shouldn't be logging onto it. I should be managing it remotely with things like Windows Admin Center. But if I do need a rich graphical experience, well now in preview, I can still use Hot Patch. And that was it. As always, I hope this was useful. Until next video, take care.